Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the, um, I believe, the third session in um, of OpenFlow. This is um, this is a joint venture between between the Crick Institute in London and um, the Flow Cytometry Core Facility at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. Um, we are um, um, going to be talking today about uh, fluorescence compensation in DIVA. And um, um, I'd like to say that this is meant to be um, an, interaction, an interactive session um, where we expect everyone to um, be able to ask questions. We'll interrupt in the middle if needed. Um, so just use that Q&A function that you have to ask questions. Um, if we can't address them immediately, we'll address them at the end. So you know, um, feel free and I encourage you all to ask as many questions uh, as possible. And that's the intention of, of making it live. Um, um, we have um, um, several instructors here. Um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Rui Gardner. Um, I'm the head of the Flowcore facility at Morals Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Um, and with us, um, you know, on the, the, the actual instrument is Kathy Daniels and she'll be able to um, introduce herself. Thank you, Rui. Um, so yes, my name is Kathy Daniels, and uh, like, like Rui mentioned, I uh, work uh, with Rui at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center Flow Cytometry Core Facility. Uh, lucky enough to have uh, been here for a couple of years working with uh, this wonderful group, and we uh, are very passionate about education and flow cytometry, which led us to have our, uh, our relationship with Derek, and uh, we're really happy to be here today. Okay, thanks, Kathy. So my name's Derek Davis, um, and I'm about 3,000 miles away from Kathy and Rui. I'm sitting in, in London. I work at the Francis Crick Institute here in the UK. And uh, my current role is it, actually in training and education. I'm the, the core facility training lead here at the Crick, although many of you will be aware that for many years I ran the core flow facility at the Crick and one of its founding institutes, um, the London Research Institute. So as Rui said at the beginning, this is hopefully going to be an interactive session. We're going to do, a we'll have a few slides, um, but we'll also look at Diva live at the machine, which is where Kathy is at the moment, which we also did in the last two sessions here. Um, so hopefully if you came to the last two, you'll be a little bit familiar with how we use, how we use Diva. We, we've looked at QC and we looked at uh, a, a relatively simple experiments um, and how we set voltages. Today we're going to ramp it up a little bit and we're going to look at fluorescence compensation and uh, the reason we left this till at, at least the third session is because it's one of those things that sometimes confuses people when they start their their journey in flow cytometry. So what we're going to do over the next 90 minutes or so uh, is look first of all at the, the principles of fluorescence spillover. So we'll have a, a few introductory slides then we'll go over to the machine. We will compensate one fluorochrome manually so that you get an idea of how that's done. Then we'll come back and look at the, the rules of compensation. So what you need to bring to the cytometer in order to successfully execute compensation. And then again, back to the practical part, we will do uh, an automatic compensation of a, of a four color panel. So nothing too complex today. But same side I've shown in, in, all of these, um, in all of these webinars, you're always going to be needing to know the cytometer configuration that you've got because that is going to limit what you can actually do. So you need to know how many lasers are in the flow cytometer because obviously that influences your, your fluorochrome choice. You can't use UV excitable lasers without a UV laser. You need to know how many detectors you have on each laser. So if, I, if I've only got two detectors on a violet laser, for example, I can't use more than two brilliant violet dyes. And importantly for this one, we need to know something about the optical filters because changing a filter will also change the amount of compensation we need, which we'll hopefully convince you of a little bit later. So right at the outset, I'll tell you what we're going to do, the, the actual experiment we're going to do. We're going to take some commercially available cells, and this time we're using these things called, um, it's called very cell from um, Biolegend. So these are lyophilized whole blood. So it should contain um, all the populations that we're likely to see in whole blood. And we're going to look at four different populations. We're going to look at CD 
16, um, so our, our, our monocytes or, or our NK cells, CD4, our helper T cells, CD19, our B cells, and then CD3, the whole T cell population. And they're labeled with different fluorochromes. So we've got PE, PECF594, PECI5.5, and then APC size 7. And as I said, we're going to start fairly simply with one sample, one color, and set manual compensation, and then we'll progress to the four color feature. So we know which fluorochromes we're going to use, and that's the first step, really. So as before, we're going to use this 18 color Fortessa that's in the MSK Flow Lab. And if I look at those fluorochromes that we're using, we're using PE, which we're using this 58615 bandpass filter to detect. We're using um, PCF594, which is that 61020, and PCI7, which is the, um, the uh, 78060 from the yellow laser. And, the, and we're using the, P, uh, the yellow laser, sorry, to excite the PE tandems here because we know we get slightly more optimized um, emission from our PE if we use the 561 laser. And then we're also using the um, the PE size 7 channel there as well. Sorry, the, the, the APC size 7 channel there. Now, one of the great things about polychromatic flow cytometry or multicolor flow cytometry is that we can design very complex experiments. Now, you know, I'm old enough to remember the, the, the very early days of flow cytometry when we had two colors, which if you just wanted to separate T and B cells was, was great. But we know that particularly blood is very complex and the more subsets we can identify, the, the better. So one of the great things about flow cytometry in recent years is we've seen a great change to the number of lasers that we have, the number of fluorochromes that we have, the number of fluorescent proteins that we have. That means that we can do very complex experiments like this. So this is a, a figure from the first 17 color flow cytometry experiment from Mario Roder's lab up at the Vaccine Research Center at the NIH. But this was a, quite a number of years ago now. And uh, you know, I'd, I'd probably say that this is still the exception rather than the norm in a lot of flow cytometry labs. Although we do have the capability of doing 20 plus fluorochromes, it's, it's a lot of work to get there. And part of that work is because we have to make sure that our fluorochromes don't overlap too much in their emission because that overlap is going to cause us problems in loss of sensitivity which we can come back to what I mean by that. But let's think about fluorochromes, first of all. And, and this is a you know, cartoon we show a lot, spectral viewer of fluorescein. So this dotted line, remember, represents the excitation spectrum of fluorescein and the filled line represents the emission spectrum. Spectrum, of course, being the key word. So we know that fluorescein is reasonably well excited if we've got a blue 488 nanometer laser not quite optimally optimally it'd be about here about 495 but 488 is good enough and we know that mostly fluorescein is going to emit green photons so we would normally choose to measure a, a band of emission and we use this 530 30 filter as a sort of standard fluorescein filter so we don't measure all of the spectrum we just measure a part of it centered around the maximum emission. If we look at PE, phycoerythrin, we can excite it with a 488 laser. We get reasonable excitation, but we get slightly better excitation at 561, which is what we'll be doing today. But the same thing. I excite my PE at 488. I get an emission spectrum. This time it's a little bit more shifted towards the orange end of the spectrum. And we typically would use this 585.42 is what I put on here to measure the um, maximum emission of PE. Now, the fact that our, all our fluorochromes, every fluorochrome has an emission spectrum, it's not just one wavelength that emits, it's a whole range of wavelengths, is what causes us problems. Now, if I put, again, the single emission of FITC, emission of PE here. But if I put those two bandpass filters that we have in this hypothetical cytometer, you can begin to see the problem that we have to overcome in flow cytometry. Because some of those photons from FITC will end up being detected in our detection filter for PE. 
we know this this is the physics of fluorescence we know there will always be some photons from FITC that are emitting in a sort of orange region of the spectrum similarly with PE I know that a few photons from PE will also be detected in my FITC filter and that's what we're going to account for when we compensate our data and I'm sure again you're probably all familiar with this sort of thing again two colors but what I've got here is three populations of cells one that's negative so it doesn't have any fluorochrome on there one that is only stained with phycoerythrin and one that is only stained with FITC now this is the data before we've done any compensation and we can see the problem that we get with this fluorescence overlap spillover because this population that's FITC positive also looks like it's PE positive now I know it isn't I know that population has only been stained with fluorescein but equally I know that some of those photons from those cells will be picked up in the PE detector and that's what I compensate so this is my same data post compensation same three populations negative just PE just FITC but now my FITC population looks like it's negative for PE which it should do of course because it doesn't have any PE on there so what we've done with the process of compensation is account for those photons that are ending up in the channel that we don't want and you're also probably aware that compensation is expressed as a, a percentage basically we work out the 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 ratio of the signal that we get in the PE channel to the signal that we get in the FITC channel once we know that ratio as every event every cell passes through the, 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 the laser beam or into the electronic system we reduce that signal by a given percentage we reduce that signal in the PE the spillover channel by a given percentage so it's important and we'll come back to this because we're calculating a ratio if I were to change the voltage of either the FITC or the PE detector it would change that ratio it would change the percentage so as we'll see it's very important that you don't do any of your compensation calculations until you're happy with the voltages that you set so if I take that very same graph let's look at uh, no compensation so what I've got here is beads in this case some negative beads and some FITC beads and if I look at my FITC histogram I can see exactly what I expect negative and positive but if I look at my PE histogram I also see negative and positive yeah, I, can, I can see that quite easily from this dot plot but if I display that as a histogram I can see those two populations again relatively easily now you know I shouldn't see this should I because there's no PE in this system at all it's either negative or it's FITC again it's simply the spillover the photons from FITC that are being detected in the PE channel now because compensation is expressed as a percentage what I can do is I can let's say I'm going to apply 10% compensation and if I just put my cursor on that population and go back to zero you can see that what's happened if I've applied 10% compensation is this population has moved down a little bit just about see that from the, the histogram but it's obviously not correctly compensated because I can still see those two populations in the PE channel so 10% compensation is not enough let's say 20% okay so that's a bit better this population has moved down a little bit further but I can still see in my histogram or in my dot plot that those two populations are not at the same level so I know that 20% compensation is also insufficient what about 30% uh, now, we, now we're getting somewhere okay. so now I can look at this and this looks like they're correctly compensated I can look over here and now rather than having two histograms I just have a single histogram that's what I expect right but remember flow cytometry is great isn't it that's why we're all here on this call that's why we work in cytometry it's great for many numbers of reasons but one of them is that I get this visualization and I can look at that and I can see well now it looks like these are at the same level in the PE channel but I want to be more certain than that I'm always going to want to have some numbers some metrics some some maths behind all of that so the question is how do we know when that percentage is correct how do we know that compensation 
has been completed when we get to that 30 percent so let's just think about you know what should be the final outcome and the final outcome of compensation is that you know both this population and this population neither of them have pe on them so they should have the same level of fluorescence or the same intensity in the pe channel in the spillover channel so what we're going to be doing is looking at the the middle of the negative and the middle of the positive population and apply compensation until those middles are aligned and how do we do that how do we do that mathematically we look at the median fluorescence intensity when the median fluorescence intensity of my FITC positives and my FITC negatives is the same in the PE channel we know we've correctly compensated because that's the correct outcome they should have the same value in the PE channel now we talked briefly about this um, last time um, remember when we're looking for statistics of a population we could use the median or we could use the mean we tend to recommend using the median because it's a little bit more robust it's a little bit less influenced by outliers and this is what I would normally recommend that you use but if you really want to choose the mean you you can do that um, I think today we are going to be using the median because that I would say is what would be current recommended best practice so we're going to see how we do this live but we can also do it offline so if I've acquired my single color control in this case I can go to in this case Flojo and I can manually compensate and the way I do that is first of all I define where my negative population where my positive population is and if you look in the compensation uh, sorry uh, and I also want to get um, the, the statistic the median for each of those the median of the negative and the median of the positive population and you can see at zero percent compensation the median of the negatives is around about 90 in the PE channel the median of the positives is around about 1900 in the PE channel so they're clearly not aligned and you can very easily see that from that picture as well so let's plug in a number let's plug in 25 percent so that positive population as we saw before has moved down again i can see by eye that they're not aligned but i can look at the median of the negatives and the median of the positives and again see that they are not the same so i'm not there yet so now it's an iterative process i change that value in that compensation box and what i'm doing here is i'm taking the FITC which is the the actual positive stain and I'm removing it from the spillover channel which in this case is the PE channel if I change that to in this case 30.4 now when I look at my means they look like they're nicely aligned here but I can show that they are are properly aligned because I have now the metric behind it both of those populations have pretty much the same median fluorescence intensity value and that's the end point of our compensation of course I can also compensate in this simple experiment FITC out of the Percy P channel or even the APC channel and you would use exactly the same process define the negatives and the positives and adjust the compensation until those two populations are in the same place so we're going to go go to the um, cytometer in a second but what I just wanted to mention briefly we can compensate our data on our flow cytometers by using either cells or beads compensation is all about fluorescence and the fluorochrome it's nothing to do with the carrier of that fluorescence or fluorochrome so it could be a cell or it could be a bead and we'll talk in a little while about the pros and cons of each of those I just wanted to introduce that here because in this first session we're going to be using compensation beads to show you how to manually compensate your data so let's go over to Diva I don't know if we've got any questions at this point exactly Derek I was just going to interrupt you um, to please do right <laughs> so if anyone has any questions about what we just went through um, feel free to um, start adding those to the, um, to the Q&A uh, while, while Kathy starts showing us how to do all this in, in, in Diva. Sounds good. 
Alright, thank okay, so you. Okay, so you can now take your control of the screen. Okay. Um, Derek, if you could just do me a favor and stop sharing real quick. Yep. Perfect. And then I will go ahead. All right, great. Okay, so I think we're up now. So thank you to both Derek and Rui. So um, one of the one of the things that we went over in the past two sessions is how to open up Diva, how to sign in, and how to go ahead and uh, create experiments and select all the detectors that you will be utilizing. So to save a little bit of time, we did set that up in advance, but I just want to give everyone a reminder of what you would be doing in order to uh, set up appropriately your experiment. And as a quick reminder to everyone, if you're having a hard time visualizing the screen, if you look at view options and select fit, uh, fit to screen, you should be seeing everything uh, nice and uh, compact on your screen. Okay, so I went ahead and in the uh, browser on my experiment or uh, in my OpenFlow account here in Diva, I went ahead and I created a new blank experiment by hovering over the a little lab notebook right here. And you can see whenever you tab over anything, it is going to tell you exactly what it does. So after creating that new experiment, I did go ahead and rename it appropriately for the compensation training for today. And you could rename that right here in the inspector. Okay. Then from there, I went ahead and I clicked on the cytometer settings. And in that same inspector, my options now change so that I can go ahead and select the appropriate detectors. So for today, we're gonna to be using the PE channel, uh, the PE Texas Red, which is synonymous or, or the same detector rather that we can utilize for PECF594, PE Psi55, and APC Psi7. All of the voltage, voltages that you see here for fluorescence are based on our optimized PMT voltages that we actually uh, showed a little bit on how to calculate that in our last session. So we have all of those here to, uh, today. And then we also have area, height, and width checked off for both forward scatter and side scatter which will enable us to go ahead and pull out single cells from any aggregates or doublets uh, that we'd be seeing in our cells. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to create a specimen so that we can start looking at our single color control and get an understanding on, on compensation uh, manually in DIVA and what compensation means, okay? So create that specimen there and once I expand out on that, uh, it, the tube automatically is created underneath the specimen, right? You'll notice that in the acquisition dashboard, everything is still grayed out. And that's because I need to select on, on that tube through this little uh, icon right here, the little arrow icon. And once we do that, we're able to actually visualize and see the options to acquire and record and make any of those changes. Okay. So in our global worksheet, I'm gonna go ahead and start setting up some of the gates so that we can uh, visualize our PE beads, which is what we're gonna to utilize today for our manual compensation. So the first gate that I'm gonna select, or a plot that I'm gonna select rather, is the dot plot. So if you can see me hovering over that right here, I'm just gonna click on it. And when I click and drag, I like to make things nice and big. I'm getting older, my eyesight's getting a little bit worse, so I like to see it a little bit better. And here we're, we're gonna see that it's forward scatter area by forward scatter height. And by left clicking on the Y axis, I'm gonna change that to side scatter. And we're gonna use that as our initial um, plot. And I'm gonna gate on our beads to be able to pull them out once we have our uh, beads uh, being acquired. So that being said, I'm going to take my PE single color beads that I know have no other fluorochrome that have been introduced except for the PE. These are ultra comp beads. So these ultra comp beads have an inherent negative and positive. So I know that when I put these on, I should be seeing two populations um, for fluorescence, not by scatter. So I'm gonna put those beads on. And like Rui mentioned and Derek mentioned, anyone that has any questions as we're doing this uh, run or as Derek's talking, uh, throughout the whole process, please feel free to go ahead and utilize that Q&A function. So one, so one thing, Kathy, that we might do is, is possibly rename the axes of the fluorescence. Uh, yes, we can absolutely do that. Not necessarily so, with the antigen at the moment, but just the fluorescence, because just that's fluorescence. what we're thinking about. Yeah, sure. 
So uh, to that note, if you come over to labels right here um, in the inspector, we could rename um, any of these detectors right here. So as opposed to the PE Texas Red, it's going to be PECF594. And the rest of the uh, fluorochromes are the appropriate names okay. uh, for the experiment itself. But now that we've named that here, and especially now that it's on the first tube, it'll carry over to the rest. Uh, once we go on uh, later on into the experiment, we'll rename all of them um, once we get into automatic compensation so that they also show the um, antigen uh, or the antibody names as well. Okay, perfect. So now that those are uh, running, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead from the acquisition dashboard and start acquiring, okay? So we can see once that, uh, once that bead population starts coming up, we see it by forward and side scatter. If I come up to the cytometer, or sorry, if I click on this population right here in the cytometer window, when I select on parameters, I have the option to change some of my voltages. So we can see here that some of our events are actually off scale by forward scatter. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to decrease the forward scatter maybe to about 450, okay? So as I restart that, I'm able to see that my beads are nice and on scale. We don't have anything uh, off, off scale, either by side scatter or by forward scatter. And then what I'll do here is I'll go ahead and I'll just create a quick rectangular gate around my beads. And once I do that, I can then go and right click and drill down. And by doing that, it's only going to show me what's in that initial P1 gate. And I'm also going to go ahead and right click on this plot and show the population hierarchy so that I can get an understanding of the gating strategy. Okay, and move that off to the side. And then I'm gonna do a quick singlet gate by selecting forward scatter area on the X and then forward scatter height on the Y. And these beads are mostly in a single cell suspension, so there's not really too much to worry about here, but just for good practice, I'm gonna go ahead and select the polygon. And each click is a node. And once I go back to that original node and click, it closes up that gate. Okay. I suppose if, if you recall what we did on the previous couple of webinars, we're using that area and height of that signal to exclude cell doublets because with a single event, the area and height will be in proportion, so up the, up the diagonal, whereas doublets or two cells in the beam at once will be off that diagonal. So we can exclude those. And as Kathy said, this is very much a monodisperse population, but it's always good practice to remove those. Absolutely. And we're going to be seeing a little bit more when we run those cells, um, a better representation of what aggregates might look like. Uh, even though because it's a lyophilized uh, cell preparation, usually they're pretty good, but we'll still see a little bit there, hopefully. Now, I don't know about anyone else, but for me, it's a little bit difficult to see that green color. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna double click right here on this little green icon from the population hierarchy, and I'm gonna change that to blue so I can see it a bit better. Okay, and then from there, I'm gonna right click and drill down one more time. And we're just gonna show two parameters, even though we have a four parameter experiment, just for the purposes of uh, showing us today um, how to do the manual compensation. So on the X, I'm gonna show PE, and on the Y axis, I'm gonna show the PECF594. And again, we know that this is a single color uh, tube that just has PE in it, and we could already see the spillover of PE into the PECF594 detector, okay? In order for us to show some of the uh, tools of compensation, I'm just gonna record this sample first, then afterwards we can go ahead and, uh, and adjust the compensation. So in our acquisition dashboard, I'm just gonna go ahead and instead of recording just on all events, I'm gonna make sure we record single beads. And to save a little bit of our sample, I'm just gonna record 5,000 for now in that P2 gate, and I'm gonna select record. As that's recording, it's just important to note, um, typically I don't utilize that storage gate because if I had selected a storage gate of P2, it's only going to record what's in P2 and P1. It will not record anything that's outside of those gates. So if you do that and say you set it based on some fluorescent marker, anything that's outside of that fluorescent marker will not be captured, okay? So be very careful about the usage of that storage gate and when you're gonna use it. Okay, 
Now, based on uh, Derek's slides and based on what he presented to us, we understand that that PE is spilling over into the PECF594 detector. In order for us to get an idea of what compensation is correct, we need to gate on the negative and positive, okay? So I'm gonna utilize this rectangular gate right here. And when I click on that, I'm just gonna click and drag right here. And then, and that's our negative. And I'm gonna click and drag around this positive population, okay? And we need to now go ahead and create some statistics, all right? Again, there are two options. You can either double click and change the color or another option, if you highlight all of your plots, if you wanna be able to visualize this green a little bit better, by highlighting your plots and then coming to the inspector right here, you can click where it says background color and you can change that color to black typically for me or any other color that you uh, might prefer that will help you pull out those populations a little bit better, okay? So, what I want to do now is I want to look at the statistics so that we can start making uh, smart decisions about how we compensate. Okay? So, Kathy, before we go on, can I ask a question? And sure. As, as a user. Okay, mm -hmm. So why have you set that gate, that P4 gate, to, to include everything at the end? And why, why have you set the, the left-hand side there particularly? Okay. So that's a, that's a good note. So essentially, we see a nice clear population that we're, that's being represented represented for our negative. And then as far as our positive goes, I actually could have brought it in a little bit more to the left, but I wanna make sure that I'm capturing the full positive population. We see that there is no events off scale, so I'm being a little bit more liberal with how I set my gate. But when I come and I bring this gate all the way to the edge, you can see one event, right? And 0%, uh, that's off scale. Typically what you want to make sure is as you're setting voltages, and we went over this last time, is that we want to make sure as we're setting these, um, your voltages that you're within the linear scale of the detector so that your compensation and your stats are all correct. So um, I'm setting it there just because I, uh, I went ahead and I, I knew that nothing was off scale, but you can always go ahead and check that by bringing the gate over and looking at your population hierarchy. Okay. All right. Yeah, good. Perfect. So then to create the statistics, we right click on the plot itself and we create a statistics view. Okay. When we create the statistics view, it's automatically going to have a lot of data in there. So it's telling us the number of events, percentage parent, and then the mean of our PE and our PECF um, detectors for all of these populations. That's a little bit too much data for what we need today. So we're going to clean it up a little bit. And we do that by right clicking and editing that statistic queue. And when we do that, I can go ahead and take out any of the information that I don't want. So for the purposes of today, I'm gonna take away all the specimen names, tube names, all of that, because this is just this one sample. I'm gonna go to population, and I don't care about the event number or the percentage of parent. What I do care about is the percentage or P3 and P4 uh, being the gates of interest because they're gated on our negative and positives. And then from the statistic, what I care about is the spillover detector. So that's the PECF um, 594. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in here and I'm going to look at the PECF 594 median. Okay. So when I do that and I click OK, we can see that the median of the negative population is 16. And the median of the positive population is 20,770. Now remember, again, I sound like a broken record, but this is just a PE single color. So we know that we should not have any PE CF594 signal. And we should see the median of this detect or of this gate, P4, match P3 in the spillover detector, which is PE CF594. Okay. okay. Kathy, can I just stop there? Because we do have a question that's, that's okay. come in there. Um, and the question is, you know, if you look at that negative population, which is P3, I think my eyes are even worse than yours, I suspect. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it looks like the negative population is being cut off. And should you have increased the voltage? Okay. So that's actually a really great point. Um, and I wanted to go over this as we're adjusting some of the comp, but we'll kind of go over a little bit of this now. So 
it seems like it's a little bit cut off, but if we're looking, this data is not showing us the, the full range, right? So it's, it's looking at it right now in the logarithmic view. So, uh, and you had two questions in there. So I'm gonna answer first about the cutoff, and then I'm gonna answer second about the, the voltage and whether or not we should have in, increased it. So first I'm gonna click on this plot and to fully visualize that negative population, which I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set it as bi-exponential in the X and Y detector, uh, X and Y um, part of the plot, right? The axes. And when we do that, we have a really nice visual representation of the negative. So don't be afraid when you see uh, that it's coming a little bit more towards the edges. I want you to take a look at that bi-exponential display and set it for each axis to bi-exponential to get that visualization. Um, now, if I take that back off, you see it's just, it's just purely a visual and it's not gonna um, have an impact on your statistics. But, but there, there, there is a little, uh, somewhere where you could stumble, isn't it? If you look at it when it's not by exponential and if you don't make your gate go all the way to the axis, yes. then you're potentially losing data and that's yes. going to affect your compensation. Yes, that's a good point. So if I came up here and I said, oh, you know, it's right here and it's not up against the axis, you see that that uh, MFI is actually adjusted now to 40 from 60 when I did go ahead and uh, go ahead and make sure it was truly around that whole population. Uh, and if, if you do the same thing, Kathy, but this show the bi exponential. So make it yeah. make sure that it doesn't quite hit the axis while it's in log. Oh. Yep. Change that up. So then you'd be missing almost half the data there. Yes. And that would absolutely. have a big effect on your compensation because you're not looking at all of the negative. Yeah, and you're not appropriately matching those MFIs if it's not dated around the whole population, absolutely. Uh, and then the second part of that question was whether or not you should have increased the voltage. What we see here is that this positive signal is going roughly to about 10 to the fifth. And we know based on our QC and characterization that that's within the linear range of this detector. And we've also optimized our PMC voltages that you can check out in our session too to get the optimal uh, separation between the positive and negative. So we know that this voltage for us is the optimal uh, and you would never wanna set uh, your voltage based on the negative from beads because beads and cells are very, very different, right? So some people might have that view where they think, oh, let me just bump this up, but beads and cells are not the same. So it's a great question and it's, it's a good opportunity for us to address that. Right. Let me let me just add that the you know the fact that you don't see the negatives, um, the whole population of the negatives, in log scale doesn't mean that the voltages are not well set, right? Like you said, Kathy, um, the voltage were actually well set. The positive is appearing in the in the linear range of the of the um, of the scale, so it was properly set. And you can always visualize the negative by by going into the by exponential and, and looking at the rest of the data. But it's important not to try to adjust voltages just because you don't see them. Yes, definitely. Absolutely. And there are uh, other methods that we'll go over for bi-exponential display and visualization and adjustment of that bi-exponential display once we do the automatic compensation with the four parameters. And I think that will be a useful tool to go over. Uh, for now, we'll leave it as is because we see a nice representation of that negative there. Okay. So now that we have our uh, gate set and we actually have our P3 and our uh, P3 and P4 gate set and we have the statistics, what I can do now is I can come to the cytometer window and come over to compensation. So compensation is enabled. And what we see here is we see our fluorochromes and we see uh, an option here uh, net minus a percentage of another fluorochrome. So as Derek mentioned, it's uh, compensation is expressed as a percentage. And what we're interested in is uh, PECF minus the spillover from PE. So if I come over here and in the spectral overlap, I type in five. What we saw is an adjustment of that population and it shifted down a little bit. So if I set it back at zero, what I want you to look at again is that MFI right here of the P4 and the PECF 594. It shifts from 20,770 and as I start going up in, uh, in the spectral overlap and the removal of the, uh, or the compensation percentage rather, that P4 MFI for PECF has gone down about 3000. Now I'm gonna continue to do that. I'm gonna make a bigger jump, maybe go to 20 and you see it gets better. 
8,000. And then I can be a little bit more liberal, and go down to 40. Okay, there, I've made a pretty big jump. And you would think I went from five to 20, and it wasn't you know, that much of a, a big difference, that by going to 20, it should be okay. But this is a pattern probably many people have seen where you get that slant, and that's indicative of overcompensation. You can see that by the statistics, and you see here that that P4 MFI in the spillover is negative 3,208. So then I'm going to come back in and I'm going to lower to 30, and it's undercompensated, right? Because the MFI is 2,800. And then we're going to go, uh, go ahead and make incremental increases, maybe 34. It's starting to look a lot better. 34.5. And I'm trying to get as close as possible between the uh, P3 and P4 in that spillover, okay? There are two significant figures avail um, as an option in uh, DIVA for us to look at. So that's the only, um, that's as far out as I can take the significant figures in DIVA when we're looking at comp. Let's take it to 35. It looks okay, right? But that MFI is a little bit too off. So as you're making these adjustments, you can see how we're correcting for that spillover while looking at the MFI changes, okay? So let's try and get it as close as possible, maybe about 34.7. But you can see this, I wanna make a point here that as we're making these changes, we're getting it as close as possible, but this is for one color into one spillover. So you can imagine the intricacies once you have a multicolor experiment in trying to make manual uh, compensation adjustments because as you start increasing the number of parameters that you're collect correct collecting for, if I could speak English, <laughs> um, it starts to become a little bit more difficult, or not even a little, a lot more difficult, and to accurately make manual adjustments to comp isn't really practical after a certain point. So um, sh we're showing you this so that you get an understanding of compensation and what it entails, but I wanna stress that that's not something that you would wanna be doing um, you know, on a routine basis, manual compensation. Well, I, I would actually even add to that. Um, it's not only that you don't want to, you shouldn't. You shouldn't be yeah. doing it uh, manually because the results are not going to be as accurate. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but when Kathy was changing um, the, the compensation, the spillover values, um, actually the median in, in P3 was also changing. And so we're affecting actually um, the median in other channels, right? So if we have a multicolor um, panel, that we're trying to compensate for manually, uh, every time we adjust one, we're kind of doing small readjustments in, an, in other channels, which will, you know, then we would have to go to those and make those adjustments, but then we're changing the, the, the first ones. So it would actually be, um, you know, not entirely correct uh, doing this manually. Yeah, I think it's th that's something you have to bear in mind, isn't it? The compensation is applied to every event there, not just the positive ones. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And that, in a nutshell, I think is uh, manual compensation in Diva. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing unless mm -hmm. there's any other questions. This way, uh, Derek can share the rest of his slides. So what we want to do, why did we wanted to do that, was to give you an idea of the sort of mathematics behind how we compensate. Uh, now we're going to look at this um, automatically. And what do you need to bring to the cytometer to successfully set compensation? Um, and there are three rules. Obviously, I, I never like saying the word rule because uh, there's always things that can be broken. But there are three things that you have to bear in mind when you come to the cytometer with your compensation controls. And your compensation controls need to be single color. So they only need to have one fluorochrome, which you know, sounds obvious, but we do have people who show up and say, right, here's my fluorescein. Oh, by the way, I added a viability dye. Okay, so that's not the single color control. So we have to have just one fluorochrome in there. And the first rule, and probably the most important rule, I'd say, was that the comp your compensation tube, compensation control tube, needs to have the same fluorochrome that you've got in your sample. And also the sub-rule there, that it needs to be treated in the same way. So if your samples are going to be fixed and permeabilized, your controls need to be fixed and permeabilized as well. Even if they're beads, 
because we know that particularly with some fluorochromes, the way we treat our samples, the way we prepare our samples, can, of, can affect the fluorochrome. So we need, we need to make sure we're controlling for that. So why do we use the same fluorochrome? Again, we will have people who turn up saying, I'm looking at GFP, but I can't find a single GFP control. My cells all got M cherry in there. So I've brought you fluorescein. Doesn't work that way because all these three fluorochromes, GFP, fluorescein, Alexa 488, they're all green. We, all, we measure them all in the same channel. But with compensation, I don't really care about that. I want to know where the other photons from those fluorochromes end up. And if I look at the PE channel in this case, it's a different ratio for each of those. And remember, that's what we're doing with compensation. We're calculating the ratio of photons from what, the green dye that end up in the PE channel. If I use a different green dye, that's going to be incorrect. So my compensation won't be right for my samples. But as I said earlier, your, your fluorochrome doesn't have to be attached to the same thing that you're using in your sample. So if in your sample, you've got a very rare antigen, for example, if you're doing a blood panel, you could use CD3 with FITC. It's the fluorochrome that you're, uh, you're compensating, not what it's attached to. However, you know, flow cytometry is never perfect, is it? And there are always caveats. And the caveats around, around that is that we always have to be aware of the tandem dyes. So if you've got a tandem dye in your experiment, and if you're doing a multicolor experiment with more than about half a dozen dyes, you will have a tandem dye in there. If you've got a tandem dye, you have to have, you have to use exactly the same dye in your control as you're using in your sample. So you can't substitute a BDP size seven for a Coulter P size seven, for example, because we know there are batch to batch, lot to lot variations and so on. So we always have to be aware of the tandem dyes. Second rule is that in your compensation control, ideally we should have a positive and a negative, and the positive should be at least as bright as anything that you're going to see in your samples. And the sort of sub rule there is that we need to collect sufficient events. We'll come back to that in a, in a minute when we actually run these controls. And when people come back to me and say, compensation is wrong, it hasn't worked. Generally they've violated one of these rules and the, the most common one they've violated is this one in that their single color control is not as bright as their sample. And let's think about what we're doing again in compensation. We're setting a pivot point, aren't we? The middle of that positive, the middle of that negative, and we're working at the ratio. We're calculating the slope of that line. So the further those two points are apart, the better, the more robust the calculation. It's, it's, it's all a mathematical calculation. So if we can make it more robust, our compensation will be, will be better or accurate. And then, um, so this, this begs the question, you know, sometimes my positives, if I'm using cells, aren't particularly bright. And that's where the use of beads comes in. Remember, as we said, it doesn't necessarily matter what the carrier of our fluorescence is. It's the fluorochrome that we're compensating. So if I'm using cells, that can sometimes be a problem if I've got a rare event, so I'm not going to get very many cells that are positive, or they're weakly positive. They're not fulfilling that second rule. And there are advantages of using either cells or beads. So the, obviously the advantage of using cells is that you don't need to spend any extra money in buying, um, buying beads. And you're binding to the actual target. You know you, your antibody is binding to an antigen. And if we get this nice negative and positive, this binary sort of result, I'd be quite happy to use cells. But sometimes it's not as easy to see where your positives are. As I said, it's not ideal for rare events and it's using your sample. Now, sometimes you're, you're sample limited. You may not want to waste your cells on your controls. So that's where these beads come in. And most of the time, these beads are antibody capture beads. So they're beads that are coated with an anti-kappa antibody. So that's going to bind to your fluorochrome, your, your antibody. Sorry. So it means you're always going to get a very bright signal. It's going to be very easily to separate that positive from the negative. And these beads are extremely easy to use. You add your antibody, incubate for a few minutes, and then you're ready to run. Well, actually, you're not because you need to run it through the same process, remember, as your samples. So they're, they're, they're very useful. Of course, they are. They, it is an expense. You have to buy them, have to use them. They don't support all isotypes. 
against all species. So if you're doing humans and mice and hamsters, and rats, for example, you're okay. If you're in the realm of giraffe immunology, it may be a bit, a bit, bit trickier. And they're antibody capture beads. So they're useful for antibodies, but not so useful for things like fluorescent proteins or other probes or viability dyes, although there are beads that capture the amine reactive dyes. And then the third oh, yeah. rule. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Before sorry. Go, sorry. Yeah, before you go to rule three, so mm -hmm. regarding rule six, uh, right, exactly. Actually, if you go back one, um, the, um, you know, one of the questions here is, is if the positive events are too bright in the compensation tubes, will that lead to overcompensation? As long as everything's on scale, that won't. No, if they're too, if you mean by too bright, they're off the axes. Yes, right. that will that will give you a problem, but we shouldn't get to that situation because we should have had a voltage that allows us to run these samples without anything being off scale. Right. And because the problem with something being off scale is we don't know what its true value is. So the compensation algorithm is going to base it on the value of the last channel, which may right. not be true. I think the question was actually, you know, um, whether the brightness of the compensation tube uh, should match the brightness of, of, the, of the sample. And yes, sorry. And yes, that, that's the case. Yes, yeah, yeah, sorry. I'm just reading this. It was hidden behind the uh, pictures. Um, yeah, if, if you're assuming that your positive cells in your sample are, are very dim, if you use that as a compensation control, it could lead to probably undercompensation, I'd say rather than overcompensation, but it would be wrong because it's not, it's not fulfilling that second rule of the things need to be as far apart as possible. Right. So, so again, the, the, the person who was asking this was, I, that's my interpretation is that, um, you know, um, you don't have to match the, the brightness. The only thing you have to uh, be aware of is whether the um, compensation the signal in the compensation tube is as bright or brighter than what you see in the in the in the sample yeah. yes yeah and, and this can be a problem with with if using beads and sometimes if you're looking at antigens that are um, upregulated over time it may the compensation may be fine for the first few samples and then suddenly you get a brighter signal and it's and it's not correct i think we'll try and um look at some of those issues in our next webinar as well. We want to try and get the basics across here first. So yes, just going on to the, th the third rule there is that before we stain them, we're going to have some negatives and some positive cells. And before we stain them, they should have the same level of autofluorescence because the level of autofluorescence of the negatives is what we're going to use as our background level of fluorescence and cells have different levels of autofluorescence so if we're looking at a heterogeneous population so this is bone marrow if I look at forward and side scatter it's sort of got a lymphocyte a monocyte and granulocyte population here it's all a bit squished because we've got these beads in here as well as enumeration beads and if we look at the FITC channel actually there's no staining in here despite what the axis says we can see that our monocyte population has a much higher level of autofluorescence than our lymphocytes and our granulocytes so that becomes important because if I'm using a lymphocyte marker to set my compensation, I need to make sure that I compensate back to the level of that unstained lymphocyte. Whereas if I'm using a monocyte marker, I would compensate it back to the level of the monocyte population. And a question we get asked sometimes is, you know, do I have to use just beads or just um, cells as my compensation control? No, you don't. You, you can mix and match them. The only thing to be aware of is that we need to make sure that we can run our cells and our beads at the same voltage. Because remember, if we change voltage, we change our compensation levels. So this, this hopefully shows that. So the red here are cells and the light blue are beads. I can run them both at the same voltage. So as long as when I set compensation, I make sure I match my positive cells to my negative cells and my positive beads to my negative beads, it doesn't matter where they are at a given voltage, the compensation value will be the same. And we know it's correct because the, the medians of those populations of the cells or the beads is the same. And uh, there's a little plug here for, for one of Kathy's post-it notes from MSK, which you can search uh, here. We'll probably, we'll, we can stick that URL in the, uh, in the chat, um, which, which talks specifically about that, uh, that third rule of compensation. So the other question that we get asked a lot is, should I run my compensation controls every time? And my answer to that is yes, I'd say. I'd say it's best practice. You should do that because things change. Your instrument can change over time. Your cells can change over time. And your, your fluorochromes will change over time. 
So we want to make sure that we're, we're setting compensation at the time we actually need it. And I would also say you should use a fresh sample each time. We do have some people who, before they've been retrained, say, I've made my samples on Monday, so I'm going to use them throughout the week. I, I would say that that was also not best practice. It's a little bit extra work, but it will, will mean that the, the, the numbers you derive for compensation will be more accurate. So just before I hand back to Cathy, just a summary of that, we know that compensation is going to be inherent to any multicolor system. And this is not just flow cytometry, it's, it's microscopy as well. But hopefully we, we can see that it's a relatively logical process. But this, this overlap is also going to impact on experimental design because it impacts on sensitivity. We're not going to go into that too much today. We really want to concentrate on compensation itself. So hopefully there'll be some more questions as we go along, but I will hand now back to Cathy and we'll look at that four color um, experiment. Remember we're using PE, PECF594, PECI5.5 and APC size 7. So three yellow laser excitable dyes and one red. Yes, absolutely. That is correct. Okay. So let me go ahead. I'm going to uh, change it around this time so that we have our nice little spotlight option so you can see everything I'm doing a little bit clearer this time. Okay, so um, as Derek just mentioned, we're going to have those four fluorochromes that we're going to be utilizing for our experiment. And you might remember uh, what we did for that um, labeling for our first tube when we looked at this to have the correct fluorochrome was we put in the PECF594. So what we can do, and I'm gonna tell you there are two different options for how you do this. You can set your labels either, either beforehand, before you go to uh, set up your automatic compensation, or you can set them after the fact, before you start recording your tubes. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to leave it with no labels. And then if we have some time after, I'll show you what happens if you label it beforehand, because Diva gives you some separate options based on how you label your tubes, okay? So I'm going to leave them without a label for now. We have it all set up. Oops, I have the instrument still running. Doing a little test run on some bees or on some cells. So what winds up happening uh, as we have our multicolor experiments is we have an option within Diva that we can set up automatic compensation, right? So I just took the labels out so we can start from scratch. And if I'm ready to go ahead and start running my uh, compensation controls, all I'll have to do is come up to experiment at the very top, compensation setup, and create compensation controls. So once I click on this, it gives us an option uh, to, or it gives us a window for creating compensation controls. And here you'll see we have a little uh, statement that says we want to include a separate unstained control tube or well, right? So if we had it in plate mode, it would be well. We're currently running it in tube mode. And we are going to utilize a separate unstained control tube or well. Uh, so we are going to have that checked off. Okay, if you do not have um, an unstained control to utilize, but each one of your single colors has an inherent negative, you can uncheck that and utilize that um, uh, a certain gate that we'll show you a little bit later on in order to make sure the correct autofluorescence is referenced. But we are going to use an unstained control so we're gonna leave that checked off and we have all of the correct fluorophores here, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna click okay. And what winds up happening when I do that is it's gonna switch over to the normal worksheet, okay? The normal worksheet will have a tab for each uh, sample that we're going through in our compensation controls. And we're gonna start off um, with running our unstained, okay? So I just expanded out here in the browser, the compensation control specimen. And when I highlight and I select our unstained control, you'll see in the normal worksheet, it tabs over to that unstained control and it has a histogram with every single fluorochrome uh, that we have selected based on uh, our detectors, okay? So with that being said, what I'm going to utilize today is actually unstained uh, cells for our unstained control. And then for all of the, um, for three out of the four, of the single color controls. I'm gonna be using beads that have an inherent negative. And then for the APC size seven, which is our CD3, I'm going to utilize a cellular single stain. Um, so 
typically uh, what you would do is you kind of assess the situation and say, okay, if I have 20 bead controls and I have one cell control, what you'd likely want to do is run your universal unstained as beads, right? This way you don't have to draw in the negative region for each one. Uh, the reason I had to adjust it up a little bit today was because we saw um, a decent shift, shift up of our, um, you know, of our signal for the APC size 7. So I wanted to follow the rules that Derek had stated about making sure that our negative is correct um, in our appropriate detector where we don't see any of that shift up. Okay? And we'll see that as we go along. So the unstained control, it's highlighted right here. So I'm going to take that sample, give it a quick vortex. Okay, click and we're going to put it on and we're going to take a look at that and start acquiring our data. Okay. So these are our um, very cells that we have on right now. We have a good number of events that we're displaying at 10,000. So we do have a good visualization of the uh, population uh, that we would expect based on these very cells and the unstained population that we're going to be looking at for today is our lymphocytes. So I'm going to be setting that P1 gate based on the lymphocytes right here. And what we want to keep in mind is that the stopping gate that we have that we can select for compensation is always going to default to all events and we can't change it to that P1. So I'm going to leave it as is. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to get an idea of what percentage is in that P1 gate so that I can make sure I record enough events that we have a statistically significant population. So I'm going to right click and I'm going to show the population hierarchy. And what we're seeing here, if we visualize uh, about 10,000 events, is we have at least 2,000 in our P1 because it's about 20% that's showing up in that uh, lymphocyte gate. So that should work just fine for us today, but because we have more than enough cells, I'm going to go ahead um, and I'm going to record about 20,000. So I'm hey, going to. Can I just interrupt you? Because this may be a question that um, other people have. They were just asking about what are the, um, the, the labels on the axis, on the x axis of each plot. Okay. Uh, so that right now is the, is the fluorocrome or the detector name, right? And we haven't changed any of the labels to accurately reflect what antibody it is. So we do have PE, PE Psi 5, APC Psi 7. The only detector name that we would need to make a clarification on uh, as far as what the actual fluorochrome that we're using is, is PECF 594. It's the same detector as PE Texas Red, if that's what they meant. Um, Sorry, actually I read, I read wrongly because then the, the question disappeared, but they were asking about the y-axis, actually, not the x-axis. Oh, the, okay. So the y-axis is count because that's uh, it's a histogram. So it's based on the number of cells. Mm -hmm. All right. Just to count the number of cells. Yeah. Okay. So then after we record our uh, unstained, which is uh, for this experiment cells, what we could do is we can go over to next tube. And now it tabs over to the PE single color. And I can uh, top this sample off and we can put the PE beads on. And from our discussions before, what we remember is that our PE, um, or our, our beads rather, are going to have a different autofluorescence than our cells will have. So if I start acquiring and I bring this P1 down, um, this autofluorescence, this negative population of the PE is going to be different for beads than it will be for cells. So um, we want to make sure that we uh, appropriately tell the software where the negative and the autofluorescence is for that type of um, uh, particle that we're using for compensation. I'll go ahead and record it first and then I'll set the gate to the negative. For beads, because what we see um, is that when we look at the population hierarchy, we have a pretty good uh, distribution of positive and uh, negative, and we have our 98% uh, that's within the P1 gate. By recording 5,000, typically we have enough, but if you record a little bit more and set it at 10,000, there's no problem with that. If you record a little bit more for your single colors, it's not going to give you um, a problem, okay? The reason I'm not adjusting this P2 gate right now, which should be around the positive population, is because once it stops recording, and you'll see that in just a second, it kind of snaps to the positive population, okay? 
So that automatically comes over and you see it's roughly a uh, split. We have about 37.5% uh, that's coming up in the positive. And then what we wanna do is we wanna select uh, an interval gate and click and drag that all the way around the negative. And if you remember our, our conversation from before, we're looking at this data in a logarithmic um, way. So if I shorten this interval gate up and I bring it up, that's only around 37.1% of the population, right? So our MFIs will actually be skewed if we don't have that P3 gate around the negative actually uh, totally encompassing the full population. So we can bring it back to that conversation that we had before and how we wanna set our negative so that DIVA knows when we're calculating the spillover and correcting for that spillover, the correct uh, MFI of that um, negative autofluorescence. Yeah. Kathy, can I ask you a question? I'm sure everybody's writing up the, the question at the moment, but I'll go ahead and, and, and ask it. There, there's many times um, people question where they should put that P2 gate. Um, should it encompass all the positive population? Should it be just the brightest, um, just a part of it? Um, yeah. how do you so uh, the MFI, or when we're looking at the median fluorescent intensity, uh, it typically tends to kind of take out any of those outliers. So if, if you had a popula or a, your gating set up like this, it really theoretically shouldn't pose a problem. But at the same time, if you have your gate set up just like this and you're kind of leaving off that tail end of the, of the negative, theoretically you wouldn't really have any issues there as well because you're taking the brightest part of your population. And if we go back to our rules about compensation, you wanna make sure your single color is as bright or brighter. So if you're around that brightest part, it won't hurt. But at the same time, if I saw a spread of the data, right? So if you were looking at something with a cellular control that had a tail of expression, I'd go around the brightest part of that population. And I would make sure that when I looked at my gating hierarchy, I had at least, um, I, I'll, I'll throw out a number, at least 500 cells to be at a bare minimum, right? If you have um, you know, a rare level of expression or anything like that, and you have to look at it in cells and not beads to make sure the software can accurately calculate um, compensation. Okay. Yep. All right. I'd agree with that. Just make sure that you include the brightest part of that. It doesn't matter so much the other, the, the left-hand side. Exactly. So then we'll go ahead, we'll go to our next tube and we'll continue for our uh, PECF594, our PECI5 and our APCI7. Okay. So uh, what winds up ha also happening, let's change this to 10,000 again and we're gonna record. If, for example, for, our, uh, for our, all of our controls, if they all had a very similar scatter gating what we could do is we can go to one of the ones that we already recorded and we already adjusted the gate and we can right click and we can apply that scatter gating to all of our compensation controls. And if I select that, um, once this is done, did I finish recording that? Okay. If I, oh, sorry, maybe because I was in the middle of recording. If we apply that to all compensation controls and come over to the rest of our uh, tubes, it's going to automatically adjust that gate and bring it in so you don't have to make that manual adjustment for each one, okay? Granted, we do have a mix of uh, cells and beads so that P1 gate that I just applied to all controls is not going to apply universally, but it is a good trick to know in case you do have to um, have a majority or you do have a majority of one particle type, okay? So now that P, uh, P2 gate automatically snapped to the positive and the PE, uh, CF594 positive. And when we go ahead, sometimes, sometimes it gets a little bit buggy, so I have to go back and forth. And when I go back and forth, it does give me those options now for the interval gate. Sometimes it's grayed out. And that's a little, uh, a little bit of a diva situation where diva doesn't like to behave. So all you have to do is just go to another sample and come back and those options will be there for you, okay? So we did the PECF594. We'll go ahead to our next tube and we'll do our PECI55, which is again in beads. So while that's just running, Kathy, there's a, there a question that I pressed the wrong button for about when, okay. when, the, when the recording actually will be available online. Um, so we will 
at the end of it, we'll give you the uh, the URL for where this will be. But it's likely to be within the next three or four days, and probably after the weekend, Monday or Tuesday next week. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and we do have our uh, open flow cytometry YouTube channel that you can check out uh, in case you've missed any of the registrations or any of the prior um, classes that we've given. You can feel free to go ahead and visit our YouTube and we have all of the recordings there. Okay, so again, hovering over that interval gate, clicking on that and clicking and dragging to go around the whole negative. And then our next for our APC size seven, this is actually going to be in cells. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put those on. We're going to adjust our P1 gates that were around the lymphocytes since it's for CD3. So I'm going to start acquiring. I'm going to adjust this P1 gate a little bit. Okay, and you can see the, um, the negative and the positive population. So we're, I'm going to leave that adjustment uh, to the SNAP2. But what I'm also going to do is I'm going to right click again, look at population hierarchy. Um, and I want to get an idea of how much is in my P2. So I could either leave, leave that go to snap two, like I just mentioned, or if I want to make sure I have a really accurate count to make sure I, I, I'll be recording enough events, you can always make a manual adjustment, right? So if I make that manual adjustment up, I have at least 500 once we're getting, um, you know, 6,000 total events. But what I'll do is I'll, I'll go ahead and leave it at all events and I'll change the number of events to record to be 20,000 and I'll record that right now. Okay. So some people might uh, wonder why I didn't go ahead and I didn't um, see the or set the unstained as beads since the majority of our single color were, were beads. And I only, in that case, I would only have to set the P3 for one sample, which is the cells. The reason I did that was because when I uh, monitored these cells um, and I did a quick QC check before throwing them on, I did see a little bit of a shift up of the negative of the APC size 7 and that could be from the introduction of a little bit too much antibody where you see some non-specific binding and that's not a true negative. So what I did is I put on the unstained cells so that we can reference that um, correct true negative autofluorescence uh, for the purposes of compensation. Okay. Okay. Well, Kathy, there are a few questions appearing here. <laughs> Um, so actually, um, let's go, you know, related to that, um, again, you were saying you, 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 you gated those lymphocytes, right? So, um, you know, why gating the lymphocytes and not, why not gating the whole thing? Um, and, um, and I missed, I was reading the question, so I missed if you, you actually addressed that question or not, which I think is important. Um, why did you gate the lymphocytes? Yeah, absolutely. So the reason I gated the lymphocytes was because that's, um, that's the area by scatter where we'll see that nice clear positive and negative for that CD3 gating. Um, if we expand out that scatter gating, the distribution in that detector is going to be wildly different. So I can show you firsthand what that looks like, right? So if I go ahead and I come here and another diva trick, if you hit the shift key and select a node, you can broaden out the whole gate. Once I start doing that, you can see that distribution is wildly different than what I just had. That's because you're going to have different autofluorescence based on different cell types. And this is, again, a lyophilized PBMC, so it's not just one type of cell. It's all the different re uh, represent, representative of all the different cell types that we would see uh, from PBMCs. So when I bring that down, if I just look here, we can see this is just the autofluorescence of this population right here, if we don't expect um, any of the uh, staining. But if I bring it down to the population where I know there's maybe some CD3 positives and CD3 negatives, we have a much clearer uh, representation of positive and negative, and then our uh, MFI will be more accurate. Right, and essentially it's rule three that, that Derek uh, spoke about, right? That the autofluorescence of the, both the negative and the positive population need to be the same, right? So if we include a lot of different types of cells with different autofluorescences, we're yeah. actually um, failing to avoid that. Right? <coughs> Indeed, and if you've got a heterogeneous population like this, this is one rare, rare area where beads are actually better for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there are some questions here, like um, one of them is regarding you know, the, um, what we were saying about gating the, the most, you know, the brightest ones. Um, so the question here is, if I have a small tail, I will ignore it. 
or what if you don't have a tail but a wide mid expression? Um, and I think you addressed that, Kathy. You were, were actually saying that. Um, so imagine a cell cultural line expressing Venus or GFP almost as a Gaussian curve. Would you still ignore the lower dimmer events? I think both you and, and Derek. Mm, I would. Yep. Exactly. I would also. Because remember, what we're, do, what we're doing here is we're, we're going to be eventually subtracting this fluorochrome from other channels. Right. So the dimmer ones aren't going to have as much impact as the, as the brighter ones. So we need to make sure we have the, the, the brightest ones in that gate. Exactly. And, and another question is, um, um, I mean, I guess this is from anonymous attendee. I don't know exactly what they meant with this. Um, but the question is, I have... I have May, I may have missed this, but setting the voltages for the colors, is it for the colors, for setting the PMT voltages, um, is it possible to do them in the compensation setup page? I guess here's the confusion where we're not setting the voltages, um, like you said in the beginning, right, Kathy? Um, the voltages are all already um, uh, set. Um, they were set in our, I don't know, first set, no, second session? Second session, yeah. <laughs> well, we showed how to optimize the voltages. And you will only do the compensation if um, the voltages are, are, are well set up, right? And once you do that, uh, you start running the compensations and you don't change the voltages uh, any longer. Yeah. Um, which, which is why it can get very complex if you have 10, 12 colors, because you, you, you need to set the voltages first and then you've got to do this compensation setup, which takes a while. Right. So another, the last question here um, is, what's the maximum number of fluorophores or channels that the diva, that diva can acquire simultaneously? In other words, how many labels can we incorporate? So that's a great question. And that's very much specific to whatever instrument you're on, right? So my Fortessa here in New York City, um, and this specific Fortessa is going to be different than any Fortessa that um, Derek might have in the Francis Crick Institute at his in in, a hit in his core facility, right? So, or in their core facility. So what you have to do is you have to go back and understand the configuration of your specific instrument in order to be able to understand how many um, specific, or how many is the maximum that you can run simultaneously and what that means for you. Because that uh, goes back to understanding the instrument configuration. So for certain instruments, it might be four. For some instruments, it might be 18. For some instruments, it might be 30. So if you go from an LSR to a Fortessa to a Symphony, um, you see the, uh, there might be a little bit of differences, but it's not just instrument specific um, based on what the name of it is. It's what the actual configuration is that is, um, it was purchased at and were up to optimized to. I, I may be wrong as well, but I think the Diva software can only really handle 30 maximum parameters anyway. So I think if we <laughs> go beyond that, we'll need something else. Yeah. Yeah, they have a, a newer software that they're coming out with uh, or have come out with for, um, for the A5 once they bring it out, the Symphony A5 once they bring it out, some more detectors. Okay. Um, right, there's another question here just to make sure that this is not confusing. CV3 seems pretty dim based on the negative population, yes. Um, so you are using the unstained instead of the CV3 negative cells? Yes, so, so uh, you know, we are doing live runs here, so sometimes things happen that we wouldn't necessarily <laughs> want to happen. So um, I, I probably could have stained a little bit, um, a little bit of a different concentration. And when we look here, uh, if we look in the unstained tab and we shift down, I'll show you exactly the mistake that happened. And this is something that is going to happen. So I don't mind that it happened today because when we look at this P1, what we see um, here for the APC size seven is you see this nice distribution of the negative and it's up around, um, you know, I would say it's maxing out a little over 10 to the second. Whereas when we come here, that has shifted up um, a little bit. So we're a lot of it, right? So that's not necessarily what we want. It's not a true negative. So that was an error in me on my staining when I went in and, um, and not having an appropriate concentration of the CD3 that caused that shift up. Right? And this is something that we can use to tell you, um, utilize the best practices, titrate your antibody, and go ahead and do all of that so that you don't run into these issues. But because I saw that, what I did is I ran the unstained as my cells so I can have the appropriate negative for that population. And, and, that, and that's why it's always useful to have that un completely unstained sample as well and run it even if you don't necessarily use it later on because yeah. it will help you troubleshoot that sort of issue. Exactly, exactly. As Rui was saying, I think, you know, it, 
theory, of course, we should be using the unstained sample every time because that's true background fluorescence, whereas our sample may not be. A lot of the time we can get away with that because uh, our preparation is brilliant, so we don't actually get any background staining. Yes, yes. Okay, so those are all wonderful questions, and if I think, I think we're good on them now. So what I like to do right before I go ahead and calculate the compensation is I tab through all of the single colors to make sure my gating is correct. Okay, so it looks good. And for all the ones that are a different particle type from our unstained, we added in that P3, right? And this, these all look good. Our unstained is gated around the lymphocyte population, which we also used for our APC uh, size seven single color. And the reason I don't have the P3 gate there is because the negative is referenced back to the unstained control, right? Now at this point, to go ahead and calculate the compensation, it's very simple. All we do is go up to experiment, compensation setup, and calculate the compensation, okay? We link and save it to our experiment. And then when we go back to our specimen and we uh, click back from our normal worksheet to our global worksheet, if you see where I'm highlighting right now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead to the next tube and we're gonna run a little bit of our unstained and then we're gonna run our fully stained sample, okay? So when I go to next tube, what I want to first look at is the cytometer tab. You can see now when we look at this cytometer tab, the compensation is enabled and all of the values that are right here have been calculated automatically by DIVA based on us running those single colors. Now you can imagine by going back to what we did before, by trying to go in and fine tune all of those values, that would be very difficult, but by running the single colors and calculating it through DIVA, we're able to get a representation uh, or the correct compensation rather for all of these uh, detectors and the spillover um, representatively, okay? So uh, we're gonna go ahead now and we're gonna change the labels for all of these. So our PE is our CD16. Our PE, uh, Texas Red Detector, is actually our uh, CD4 for PECF594. Our PE Psi 5 is CD19, and our APC Psi 7 is CD3. So now what's gonna help us out is we're going to be able to go ahead and we're gonna be able to uh, have labeling for all of our fluorochromes as we go through, okay? So now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna put those unstained cells back on and we're gonna record some gated cells here. I'm gonna pop our water off. I'll put the unstained cells back on. Well, you, well, you do that. Um, there's a question here. Would you recommend using unstained beads as a universal stain control or universal unstained control? Sorry. I would only recommend that if you had only uh, unstained beads for all of your single colors and it's the same bead type, right? So if you had the same bead type for all of them, for example, for this, you would be running uh, ultra comp for all of them, then that works and that should be okay. If you had one or two samples that were not those beads, you can use the P3 gate method for that. So just what we did here, uh, you could do the same thing for beads. And then if your cells uh, didn't have that shift up of the negative, you could just draw the P3 on that one. So you right. can utilize uh, uh, beads based for the universal negative. Right, I guess, I guess like if you have 18 colors and 12 of those um, you know, or 17 of those are, are beads, then maybe it's better to just use beads as understand control. But um, but really the question here is if you're using both beads and cells, you can only use one as an understand control, right? either beads or cells. And then you have to make sure that the others, um, let's say you use beads as an, a universal understand control, then you have to make sure that in your cells, you always have the negative there in each single stain control, right? And vice versa. If you're using cells as un, un, universal unstained control, then you need to make sure that you have your negative um, uh, bead uh, in, in each single state control when, when you're looking at beads. Yeah, absolutely. So now what I'm going to... Oh, sorry. sorry I, was just, I was just going to say that that also brings up the point that there are different types of bead out there and lots of different manufacturers make make beads, some, some of which have a negative bead in the, in the pot and others where you have to add the bead negative bead separately. Yeah. 
exactly. And one of the things that I do like telling people about um, is the arc amine beads that we utilize uh, sometimes for people that are using the fixable uh, viability guys. Uh, it does have, you do have the negative and the positive for those arc amines, but you have to be very careful about when you add in your fixable viability dye to those because the negative can shift up and that's exactly what we don't want. So be careful and mindful of the use of those. And honestly, when you're doing single color viability, I typically tend to recommend using cells. And if you don't have many dead cells doing a heat kill of a small aliquot and putting that in so that you have a nice representation. Okay. So running a little bit late on time, what I'm going to do is I'm, I didn't record a full 20,000 for our unstained, but I'm going to go to our fully stained here. And I'm just going to start recording and walking you through some gates that I'm going to set, be setting up. Okay. So I have it set up on P2. I'm just gating based on the lymphocytes right now. We'll try and see if we can get to 20,000. I'm gonna go ahead and start recording. Get I have here a comment, a comment from, from Svetlana from the Rockefeller mm -hmm. University saying that an other valuable option is to spike in the unstained beads or cells into your single stain control. We'll be able to use the P3 gates for any single color control, right? In case of you know, having you know, those beads that, that don't come already with a, with a negative. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Good suggestion, thanks. Thank you, Svalana. So we have our, uh, our gate setting up, our, our scatter gate based on lymphocytes right now, our single gate. We actually really don't have many aggregates, right? But we went over that in previous sessions. And then from there, I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna drill down. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, show as it's recording, um, the N by N of all the colors versus each other so we can really see uh, all the staining that we've had from this uh, experiment. So we'll look at CD16 here versus the uh, CD4, okay? If you hit control and you have the plot selected and drag it over, it automatically creates. Ooh, it's not happy with me as it's recording. I'll try that again. I'll just do a duplicate. Uh, but that is a trick that I'll hopefully be able to show you uh, once it's done recording. Then we can go ahead and change it from CD16 versus CD4. To CD16 versus CD19. Okay. And we'll do the same thing by duplicating and we'll show it versus CD3. Okay, from there, I'm going to highlight and we're going to duplicate. And then when I do that, by having these two plots uh, selected, I can come to the inspector and I can change it from CD16 to CD4. Okay, when we do that, it's changing it so that we have the PECF versus the PE Psi 5 and the APC Psi 7. And then I'm going to duplicate just this last one. And then we'll be able to look at our PE Psi 5 versus our APC Psi 7. Okay. I think we have enough events, so I'm going to stop recording and I'm going to stop acquiring. If we have more time later, we can always record more if we'd like to. Um, but right now, what we have is we have a representation of all of our fluorochromes versus each other. And in order to get a better represent or visualization of all of this data, I'm going to highlight by clicking and dragging all of these plots. And I'm going to put all of these in bi exponential display. And when we do that, we can see the results of our compensation and we can see how it's uh, corrected for the spillover of all of the single colors or all, all of the fluorochromes into adjacent parameters. One, one yeah. thing I do like about DVAL, Kathy, she'll probably just get back to go into this. If you go yeah. to the compensation tab is we can toggle that compensation on and off. Yeah. And then we can see what that data would look like when it's uncompensated and compensated. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's a really great point. And it's really nice for us to be able to see how that, our data looks and what we be trying to, um, you know, visualize without compensation, it would be impossible to be able to get appropriate uh, population percentages, statistics, all of that data would not be reliable unless we ran our appropriate single colors and uh, enabled compensation. Okay. The other thing I just want to briefly touch on too, is you can see there's quite a bit of space in some of these um, plots on the negative end, and we could always adjust that by exponential so that it's not based on automatic scaling, but we can adjust it manually. So I'm going to show you one example. So just for a better representation or a better visualization, if we come up to view up, up top here and go to by exponential editor, we can switch it to manual from automatic. 
And you can see this APC size 7 has a lot of negative space here. So instead of it being 2154, I can try bringing it down to about 500, 200, so on and so forth. And you can see that negative um, distribution or the, the distribution of the negative is now a little bit clearer for us. And if you want that by exponential uh, value uh, to be applied to the whole experiment, and you don't want it to change from sample to sample, all you'd have to do is apply that to our experiment, and then it'll go ahead and apply to all samples. Okay, so that's a basic overview, I think, of compensation. You might have a couple of questions, but we're, um, we're at 2.33 now, so we thought we should start wrapping up soon. <laughs> so I guess it's time for any questions. So, right, so, so I'm not seeing any questions so far. Um, we've been answering them um, as we went along. Let me just, um, this should be a plug-in, or this could be a plug-in for our next session on actually troubleshooting, troubleshooting problems with, with compensation. And I think you have here a very nice example of, you know, the problems of tweaking things by hand. Mm -hmm. There is a, a huge um, bad practice of people compensate. At the end, they do all this, and then you know, if it doesn't yeah. look good, we'll adjust it by hand. And you have there a great example where you can see the C16 uh, PE. So that plot on the right uh, in the middle, you have 16 um, you know, versus the CD3, exactly. So this, this would seem that it's badly compensated because the negative population is much lower. Um, so you know, there could be the tendency of, of, of just tweaking it and then getting it as low as the, the negative population. But it happens that as you highlighted that, right? Um, you can see that those are monocytes and they're appearing, so they have much more autofluorescence. And so it makes sense that they are actually higher in the, um, you know, in, in, in the CD3 um, channel um, than, than the lymphocytes, right? So it's actually, it seems to be, um, or it seems to be not well compensated, but it actually is uh, well compensated as long as you follow all the rules. Yeah, yep, absolutely. But the, but the thing is, if, if even if you now put a granular site marker in there and looked on the on the granular sites, everything would still be correctly compensated for those fluorochromes because it, it, once we've got the set voltage, that compensation is applied across the whole scale. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, and that's what enables us to be able to utilize beads for compensation as opposed to using cells, and you don't have to worry about that. And that all ties in. To the rules of compensation and what we want to take into account when we're doing this. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so we've got a couple of wrap up slides. Okay, so I'll stop sharing here. Let me go ahead. Okay, all yours. And I can share that again. Well, I could. There we go. <laughs> Okay, so I see so, no other questions, I guess. Yeah, so we, we can go past that one. So. Right. So again, thank you everyone for, you know, for attending this um, the virtual class. Thank you, Kathy, for wonderful explanations on how to work on Diva. And, and Derek, of course, for um, excellent uh, presentations. Um, so it's just important to, to mention that we have a YouTube channel where you can see this recording, as Derek mentioned, in about uh, two, three days. Uh, we'll have it on, on our YouTube channel. And we also have the previous sessions. And this is where we're going to be adding uh, all the virtual classes that we do. Um, and please shoot us an email, right, if you still have any questions, um, even after you've seen the, the video again. Um, and again, just to mention that our next um, um, virtual class will be September 18th. We're going to take a break in, in August. Um, you know, us Europeans might go a month on holiday. You know, if you're American, probably just uh, two or three days. Um, but we will be talking about in September about um, problems in, in, in compensation. So again, one of these issues like uh, tweaking things by hand, or if you don't follow these rules, what are the things that you could expect? So please register through this link. Um, again, you don't have to memorize it. Just just go to our YouTube channel and, and um, it will be there in two or three days. So thank you, everyone. Right, and that's just the last slide, which gives you our contact details as well, should you actually want to, to speak to us. Or, of course, following both of us on Twitter, all of these will be put, uh, put out there as well. Exactly.